We talk a lot about de-risking, right? This is the vogue term these days. Well, the public sector is absolutely de-risking the financial sector, for example, right? We invent new institutions to impart more stability on the system, to eliminate bank runs, to eliminate defaults on certain financial assets. The public sector uses its exclusive spending powers to de-risk tech investment. We provide large contracts, guaranteed profits. We believe it's important to provide the subsidies. The one thing that we don't seem to be de-risking very effectively is the labor market. What MMT brings to the table is an understanding that unemployment, in fact, is engineered by the monetary system. And it says that we have a concrete tool in the form of the job guarantee, the employer of last resort, that can provide that public option. This is the MMT Podcast with Patricia Pino and Christian Riley. Hi, I'm Christian Riley, and welcome to the Modern Monetary Theory Podcast. You can find us on Twitter at MMT Podcast, and you can support the show by going to patreon.com slash MMT Podcast. If this is your first time hearing about MMT, you might want to listen to our first three episodes for an introduction, which I've linked to in the show notes, along with some other things that relate to this particular episode. And as ever, I've linked to where you can support this podcast financially via patreon.com slash MMT podcast. Support starts at a dollar a month or a pound a month or whatever the equivalent is wherever you live. We're 100% listener funded. Your financial support really helps keep the show going and your support in other ways, whether it's by recommending us to other people or just by listening and spreading the word about this stuff really helps too. A big thank you to all of our supporters so far and thanks as ever for the time you put into understanding MMT. Let's dive in. Welcome one and all to the MMT podcast. I'm Christian Riley. And I'm Patricia Pino. And it's our absolute pleasure to welcome back to the show, Director of the Economic Democracy Initiative and author of the must-read The Case for a Job Guarantee, Professor Pavlina Chernova. Hi, Pavlina. Hi, it's good to be back. So, Pavlina, we wanted to talk about your chapter in the recently published MMT Key Insights Leading Thinkers, and that chapter is entitled Three Lessons from Government Spending and the Post-Pandemic Recovery. And lesson one of the three lessons is the funding is always there. Just for anybody new to MMT, can you say what you mean by that? Well, basically, crisis after crisis, we see that whenever governments wish to provide funding for whatever policy priority um, they have, the funding, no matter the size, is available. There are no limits, constraints. There's no wringing of hands or calling up of taxpayers. Public institutions are there to fund those policy priorities. So it really is supposed to put to rest this question of how do we pay for various programs and objectives. And so given that, as you write in the chapter, quote, the central lesson of the COVID fiscal response is that money isn't scarce, end quote. Could you give us your thoughts on the recent debt ceiling drama that just concluded for now, at least over there in the US? Well, it has become like Groundhog Day. You just anticipate that every time government expenditure approaches that arbitrary limit, this has become a political tool to undermine various other programs and policies. So it's completely artificial. It is counterproductive and diverts attention to the important economic concerns at hand. So in a sense, we are trapped in a false conversation, trying to debate whether or not the public sector has the funding to pay for programs, where in fact, we know very clearly that it does. And it's just a matter of what we prioritize and then put together our existing tools to fund those policy priorities. I mean, one of the things that I discussed in my chapter is that, yes, money is not scarce, but money is also fundamentally a public institution. And despite the very many intricacies that we see at the institutional level, different countries have ministries of finance, central banks, they coordinate or not in different ways, whatever those legal institutional arrangements are, the bills get paid 
for what we would call monetarily sovereign nations. And major crises illustrate that even those institutional arrangements are not really a limitation to paying for crises. And then what we also saw in the pandemic is that countries that do not have monetary sovereignty, well, they were not able to respond in the same scale, the same size, but some countries tried to rediscover their monetary sovereignty, notably those in the Eurozone. And the Eurozone broke its own rules, implemented various funding mechanisms to allow countries to respond with the kind of large-scale government packages that were necessary to address the crisis. And since you bring up the Eurozone, in your chapter, you compare German unemployment to US unemployment over the initial pandemic response period. Tell us about that. Yes, I mean, this is fundamentally a question of how governments spend. It's really rather trivial to observe that countries that have currencies, which are public monopolies, do not have operational constraints to spending. They are not going to ever run out of the currencies that they issue. So that is a rather trivial observation. It is an important one that MMT has emphasized because, frankly, no one else has done it. But what we have always attempted to do is to say, listen, we are trying to shine a spotlight on the way governments spend. And we need to go beyond this conversation of can we pay for our programs because we do have institutions that can. And so we've spent considerable time explaining some of this financial architecture and some of these historical artifacts like the debt ceiling, like debt to GDP ratios, and uh, the kind of legal separation that might exist, or at least limitations between fiscal and monetary authorities. So we've spent some time doing that because the institutional analysis is important in illustrating these capacities of governments. But then what we are really interested in is the question, how do we spend? And what is the economic outcome? What is the effectiveness of that spending? And COVID gave us some insights into that question, because when you survey the major OECD countries, developed countries, we see different size packages. So Japan, traditionally, <laughs> always have been very fiscally bold and aggressive, and they had spent over 50% of GDP to address the COVID crisis. The United States, we spent the equivalent of 26.9% just in, in 2020 alone. I mean, that is quite extraordinary. In the post-war era, we have not seen this size government expenditure. The last comparable such spending was during World War II and the Great Depression. But then there are countries like Germany, Italy, France, that spent about 10% of GDP. And as I just said, there are obviously constraints, monetary constraints, but those were relaxed and the spending was supported by the European Central Bank. But they also came out of the recession, despite their smaller relative spending, with lower unemployment rates. Or in fact, they just didn't allow unemployment to accelerate to the degree that it accelerated in the US. So again, in the US, 27% of GDP, but we ended up with 14 almost 15% unemployment rate at its peak. That's extraordinary. Germany spends about 10%, but they end up with peak unemployment 5.5. Why? And that really is about policy design. It is about the way the governments chose to respond. And in Europe, the policy choice was to protect payrolls. Whereas in the United States, we simply allowed firms to lay off workers in mass. And then on the back end, we decided to provide income support, expanded unemployment insurance, various other stimulus programs. And these outcomes are certainly not inevitable. They're very much policy choice, which is, I guess, the second lesson that I highlight in my chapter, that unemployment at bottom is a public policy choice. Would you say, though, that in that, because here we had something called a furlough and people would be kept on the payroll, but that's despite the fact they were sent home because the law here was that you can only be in furlough if they're not working during that period, right? And isn't that hidden unemployment though? Isn't the effects of that similar to other types of unemployment might be? Yes, in a way, yes. But also note that this was quite a different 
crisis from the conventional recession that we see. This was very much a supply side crisis where businesses closed doors and production stopped. And we just tried to engineer a pause in the global economy. And so, yeah, in a sense, if you're not going to the office or if you're being furloughed, that is a kind of hidden unemployment that is a consequence of the shutdowns. But the furlough also keeps you attached to the job. It also affords more a better reintegration in the labor market, better transition. Whereas in the United States, they were, there are a lot of workers who do not have first the formal employment arrangements that we tend to observe in Europe. And when restaurants shut down or they close their doors permanently, then those folks are in a very real sense unemployed. And the government did provide income support, but the transition back into the labor market was more difficult. Now, I think it's important to note that we had still seen the fastest, swiftest recovery in post-war history. But then we got to ask ourselves these questions. Was it the government that did that? Was it the large-scale government spending that rescued the economy? Is it to me, the answer to that question is both yes and no. If we did not have this significant support on the fiscal side, then what was a temporary pause in the labor market would have become a permanent devastation. And so in a sense, we provided that kind of income support for folks to come back in. But also, no, because it was largely a supply side shocked. And so when the economy reopened, firms were able to bring back large swaths of the labor market. But then also that begs the question, well, what happens next in the next crisis? Would we have to rely on 20, 30% of GDP government expenditure to engineer a very rapid recovery? And I think that the answer is no, there's hardly any appetite for this scale of government spending. The politics definitely don't give us any reason to be optimistic, but also we tend to address these crises by relying on these discretionary expenditures. And so, again, the question is, how should government respond to crises? Are there better ways to spend financial resources and address real crises? And in your chapter, I think the line that nails the difference between the US approach and, say, the German approach is this line. From a macroeconomic perspective, the policymaker has two choices – either close the output gap or close the employment gap. Can you lay that out for our listeners? No, absolutely. This is a very peculiar way in which economists tend to think about the problem of unemployment. You see, often when we define an economy that is a fully employed economy, we don't actually mean people. Conventional economists tend to think of some sort of output, potential output that the economy can reach. And so that would imply, yes, people working, but also factories operating at high capacity, resources uh, not being underutilized. So it's a very amorphous, abstract concept of full employment. And often when we talk about unemployment, we talk about deviations of actual GDP growth from this mythical potential. But you see, we can close that gap. And that's what essentially recoveries do. We can bring us back either close to that previous growth path, or we simply reduce the growth path. The potential gets redefined. And so the output gets closed through these two effects. But what we've seen in the post-war era is that we've seen jobless recoveries. So in a sense, we are closing the output gap, we are restoring growth, our economy is recovering, but the payrolls do not return at the same rate. So while increases in production should imply increases in employment, there's no like stable ratio. And if our attention is just on the GDP number, on growth, then in a sense, you can accomplish the goal of returning the economy to a growth path, but you still have many people who are unemployed. And this is a fundamental problem. The European approach, I think, recognized that you need to protect people, their employment, payrolls, whereas in the US, that was not the focus of policy. The focus was, well, how large should government spending be to grease the economic wheels and hopefully restore growth when the pandemic is over? 
On the subject of the European Union, because as you mentioned, the rules got relaxed over there in order for the pandemic response to happen. Despite the fact that the rules got relaxed for a few years, there was less than expected government spending in a number of countries. And I was wondering what your view may be about the why in the context of, okay, there are no restrictions now, we're going to support all government spending in the European Union. Why would governments hold back when before they would quote European Union rules in their spending? Yes, I mean, that's a really good question. My sense is that when we are trapped in a paradigm of austerity for decades and decades, policymakers don't just wake up one day and say, hey, our hands are untied. Let's just go and do everything we can to support our economy. I think that there's that general principle, you know, the folks in elected office tend to be fiscally conservative. They are not as progressive in terms of social and economic policy. So that would be one hurdle. I think that they may have been also the question of what happens next. And that is a question that, you know, is being discussed at the European level. Do we urge countries now to go back to the Maastricht criteria now that they have accumulated increasing debts, in part as a consequence of the COVID pandemic? Do we now impose on them of a harsher austerity to bring them back under the 60%, the impossible 60% debt to GDP or the deficit? And that may be one other reason. And I think the third reason is related to the first, like low appetite for spending, is that in some sense, we have also either not built or destroyed public institutions that would be there to address problems with, well, infrastructure, gaps, care needs gaps. The paradigm has been so much reduce the public support, privatize essential services. So that is another hurdle of swift and quick responses and spending on care needs and kind of essential needs. While we're on lesson two, which as you write, unemployment is a policy choice, just in the theory, MMT is focused on bringing about full employment with price stability. Most people understand why we'd want price stability because we all hate inflation, but maybe people new to this don't understand the dual emphasis on price stability and full employment. And maybe some people think full employment is a nice to have rather than a must have. So for anybody new here, why the emphasis on full employment? Well, this is also a particular artifact of how the economics profession has evolved. Full employment was not a nice to have. I think all mainstream and non-mainstream economists will say that full employment is a precondition for a good economy for one that delivers prosperity, for one that has solid foundations. However, over time, full employment has grown to mean great many things, except jobs for all. And frankly, we do hear this not just from only from mainstream circles, but even some of our you know, heterodox friends will sometimes say, look, we don't believe in the Nairo, but there is an unemployment level that is consistent with full employment. To me, that is also a paradox. We can't meaningfully define full employment as some level of unemployment. Now, MMT argues that perhaps the critique of the Nairu has not been as effective because heterodoxy doesn't have a genuine alternative to the unemployment stylized fact that there is some sort of tacit acceptance that we can try to do as much as we can, but we will never finish the job completely. There will be always some unemployment. And MMT outright rejects this proposition. And it says that we have a concrete tool in the form of the job guarantee, the employer of last resort, that can, in fact, provide that public option. Now, this idea of the job guarantee is not new, There is a long history, I would say, specifically out of the human rights, economic rights tradition that has emphasized jobs for all. What MMT brings to the table is an understanding that unemployment, in fact, in many ways is engineered by the monetary system, that there are just fundamental aspects to the way money works that contribute to the existence of unemployment and specifically imposing taxes and obligations on the economy. Yeah, I think in your lecture at the Levy Summer School last year, you said it's an original sin. 
Yes, exactly. That is so at the core of a monetary economy that, I mean, it's the old adage, nothing else is certain but death and taxes. It is there is that, that very fundamental like question that it's true that taxes have always been part of whatever economic system we want to look at. And taxes have always been there to generate some sort of resource transfer, to tax somebody and transfer those real resources to somebody else, right? So taxation means that somebody has to work to produce resources so that then those, and I really mean real resources, I'm not talking about working to produce money, if we are working to produce grain, services, commodities, to provide our own time to the taxing uh, authority, whatever that may be. So taxes have always been this mechanism of organizing work and transferring resources. But in the modern system, this organizational system is hidden behind the veil of money. We don't really see deeply what taxes do to our system. All we see is that people get taxed, their income gets taxed, profits, etc. And then that these are paid in monetary terms. But we pay them in the unit of account that is established by the public sector and in the very financial instrument that is imposed by the government sector. And so in some sense, the public sector is not only imposing the tax obligation and creating the need of people to work for the currency, but they also have the unique capacity to provide the very employment that will choke off that demand. This creation of unemployment by taxation, to what extent does it rely on power imbalances in the private sectors? Because I've seen a lot of proposals for different types of tax, taxing land, taxing rent, taxing all sorts of things. And capital always seems to be very creative in its way and rentiers, very creative in their way to pass on this burden to workers. And then I guess you could see it and then that generates the unemployment. Could we, in an imaginary society where there is no class, would we be in a better position to eliminate unemployment completely? Uh, yeah, this is really like a philosophical question. <laughs> Sorry. How do we envision a society that is fairer, that provides a good life? I think that's a really huge question. And I think finding meaningful, decent employment is one way in which we self-determine. And I think that there are, in just even this society, there are more equitable ways of doing this and providing these opportunities for folks who absolutely need them. I think that the other philosophical aspect to your question is that what MMT illuminates is that money has a fundamental kind of public character and nature, but also that money is also from inception a political project. So you can't eliminate the question of power because it's right there from the start. Who gets to tax who? How are folks taxed and what do they have to deliver and to whom? To the palace in the form of slave labor or to the polity in the form of some sort of democratic redistribution of resources? Like these are political questions. They are questions of power and distribution. And so fast forward to the modern day, what do we talk about often? We talk a lot about de-risking, right? This is the vogue term these days. Well, the public sector is absolutely de-risking left and right and has been de-risking of the financial sector, for example, for decades, if not centuries, right? We invent new institutions to provide, to impart more stability on the system, to eliminate bank runs, to eliminate defaults on certain financial assets, the public sector uses its exclusive spending powers to de-risk those markets and de-risk yeah, capital. Now, we do this sometimes in terms of de-risking strategic investment, let's say tech investment. We provide large contracts, guaranteed profits. We believe it's important to provide the subsidies. In a sense, we're de-risking the investment. The one thing that we don't seem to be de-risking very effectively is the labor market. We had done a little bit after the Great Depression. We put in place minimum wages, eliminated child labor, social security, standard labor contracts in some countries, not others. So we've made some progress and then we've stopped. Economic insecurity still is with us. And that insecurity, a huge part of that insecurity originates from the inability to secure stable, well-paid job. So there are policies that can continue to de-risk the life of families by focusing on employment. 
<laughs> yeah, all we're asking is for policymakers to imagine that human beings are banks and then write policy accordingly <laughs> as if they were as precious as banks. In a way, it goes to Bill Mitchell's point about he was studying agricultural economics and he sees the wool price stabilization scheme as basically this is a full employment of wool scheme. Yes. There's no zero bid for wool. And it's like, well, maybe we can care about people as much as we care about wool. Uh, you know, we might get to a better economy. <laughs> yes, absolutely. I love that example. But I also often think of the gold standard because like that speaks to our just obsession with shiny little objects because we it's a full employment of gold, essentially a gold standard, but we don't have one for people. So the, this problem is solved and you've written so much about this and, and a fantastic book, The Case for the Job Guarantee. And so people like us, we kind of understand where you're coming from. Out there in the media, there are a few talking points that I'd like to be able to push back on. We're told by the media that the problem isn't unemployment, that unemployment's low. And the real problem is this thing called a skills gap. What's your response to that? This is another Groundhog Day conversation. Time and again, we slog through these recoveries and then we arrive at the conclusion that there never was a skills gap. I mean, just today we had the data that came out, the employment data, and we saw a huge jump in labor force participation rate in prime working age people. And so up to a few weeks ago, everybody was saying, well, we've ran out of workers. We don't have enough people to take these jobs. They've decided to just exit the labor market and retire the great resignation. And here we are. As soon as the labor market does a little better, people come back in and start looking for those employment opportunities. The Great Recession was explained as the slow recovery out of the Great Recession was explained through, again, hysteresis effects and people losing their skills because they've been unemployed for a while. And listen, there is something to that. When you don't work, there is a difficulty to get back in, but not because people are unemployable, but because firms are not ready to come and provide the employment opportunity and on-the-job training. So we don't really have skills gap as a dominant narrative, it's not a compelling explanation for aggregate outcomes. It may very well be true that in some specific areas, there's a shortage of particular type of skill. But this is not an aggregate story for the labor market because there just tends to be significant labor markets like, and we haven't really seen truthful employment outside of conditions of World War II. This goes back a little bit to what you said about the mythical output gap. And it seems like something very tricky to estimate with any degree of confidence. Even when we speak about the job guarantee and we talk about that if there is 3% unemployment, we don't really know how many people might take it on if it is introduced. Is there, in your view, any reliable way of making a, an estimate? of how much would the economy expand or how many people would join the workforce? It is a very difficult question, and I'm not sure that would necessarily be a useful guide to policy. I mean, just as a little bracket, I just love how John Maynard Keynes used to call the potential output measure. He called it an imposter because potential output cannot tell you what the economy can potentially do and produce except for an instantaneous moment in time. But we invest and we produce more capacity. We generate more capacity that can then yield greater investment. The labor force is affected by a great many things. And I think that we don't have a complete understanding of how many people would come in if the employment conditions are better. This economy is a good moment to look at participation rates. Why are people leaving because crisis after crisis, we see that people are exiting the labor force and they are not coming back in to make up those losses. This is the case for the United States, at least. We have had a long-term decline in male labor force participation rates around the world, but the U.S. is below our European counterparts. Even though in Europe, men are exiting are not at the same rate as in the U.S. Women in the U.S. had entered in great numbers in the 60s and the 70s, and then that entry flatlined in the 90s. Now women seem to be exiting, but that's not true for our developed countries in Europe. Women are continuing to enter the labor force, and there are policies that support their employment opportunities. Now, just because you've entered the labor force doesn't mean you have found employment. But you see, it tells you something about the need and the desire to work. 
And then there are just so many other nuances in these numbers and the dynamics in the U.S., for example, in the flows data, folks who find employment tend to come from outside of the labor force. And so we don't have very good surveys to understand why they're outside of the labor force, except to note that, for example, reasons of disability is the most important reason why they are outside of the labor force, outside of care. And people haven't gotten suddenly sicker because this is not a COVID-related phenomena. This is a phenomenon over the last 20 years. So what happened in the last 20 years that made people suddenly sicker? What I think a disability is a proxy for precarious work and stable work and economic insecurity, or at least in part, it is a proxy. So there are so many things that are happening in the labor market that if we were to think of a policy, full employment policy, trying to figure out how many people would enter would be a useful exercise if you were trying to do a job guarantee. But it wouldn't be a useful exercise to tell you how much stimulus to put in and when should you stop. Like we want to target a participation rate. I think that we need to allow people to determine whether they want to be in the labor market. And that might give us much higher participation rate that we may calculate. That might give us lower participation rate, which will tell us that there is a good chunk of people outside. And we need to be looking at why are they outside and what kind of economic policies do we need to support them? Is it because they're caregivers? Is it because they're going back to school? Is it because they're aging? So you see, I think in terms of policy design, I think we need to create open-ended policies that will accommodate whatever influx of workers we observe. I've also heard the argument very often that actually employment is restricted by capital availability. And I think this is an argument often made particularly with developing economies. And I've noticed as well that when Warren does pricing for job guarantees, he does include in there 10% cost allowance for capital required for new employees. What would you say to those people? Which one comes first? Is it capital or the employment? Well, I think what we've seen is that we can create direct employment that is low capital intensity and we make use with what resources we have at hand. And we also have seen cases where people figure out ways of doing the kind of work that is provided. So some will be more capital intensive, some will be low capital intensive. I mean, in, in developing countries, we have seen some of the largest scale employment programs. So I wouldn't say that employment is actually in any sense constrained by the availability of capital. I mean, if you see rural employment in India, which on a given year provides employment to 25 to 35% of rural households in very, very poor conditions, and you see the kind of work that they are doing in terms of water conservation and some kind of environmental renewal, or even just frankly, doing as basic things as building toilets in areas that don't have any irrigation, etc. I mean, these are essential. They're absolutely essential for those communities, and they're not constrained by the availability of capital. It reminds me of in Peru, very often people say that in Peru, the working class is very creative. And even you see it in people who are hired to clean roads. We don't have the fancy machinery that they use in the UK to clean the roads and the pavements. And they use instead they're like big trees and they have a really long brush shaped leaves and they just use that and with a sweep they just do it all in one go and I thought that was so ingenious. <laughs> I mean I used this example when I went to Argentina to visit some of the projects. It was really amazing to me to see how people will donate some of their garages so that they would be the site of work and 10, 20 people will pack in and they will be knitting or making children's toys and People find very creative ways to do what needs to be done as long as the support is there. And that's also a very interesting criticism that we see of the job guarantee that there's just no way, we don't have the capacity, we don't have the know-how, we don't know how to do the work. But so long as you involve the communities, they know what to do. They also know how to do it. We'll be right back after this message from our sponsor. Hey there, dear listener. Our sponsor for this episode of the MMT podcast is you, the listener, and we can't do it without you. 
And when I say it, I mean our aim to promote the best understanding that we can put together of how this thing called the economy actually works and how we can make it better. And we think a big part of that is knowing that better is possible and that many destructive policy choices are often sold to us by falsely equating the spending capacity of a government to that of a household. The way your government spends is nothing like the way a person or a household spends because currency issuing governments are the source of their own spending money. Unemployment, underemployment, underfunded public health services, poverty, and many other things that politicians and pundits sell to us as sad but necessary are actually never necessary. Our money system has been mischaracterized in the media and academia for decades. An electorate that knows how it works can truly change things for the better and literally save lives. So we hope you can find it in your heart to support us via patreon.com slash MMT podcast because it really helps keep the show going and we want to make it bigger and better. So thanks as ever for the time you put into understanding MMT. Let's dive back in. So just to take the high level macro view of the job guarantee, we like to say the job guarantee is a superior automatic stabilizer to the current approach. What do we mean by that, Pavlina? What's an automatic stabilizer? The first thing that people recognize is that the economy goes through ups and downs. And we have expansions, recessions, downturns, growth periods. What most people probably don't think about on a normal day is that we don't have depressions, right? That there was a time when the developed countries, the industrialized countries, experienced huge booms and busts and major depressions. And the public sector then grew to provide stability to the economy in the form of various income supports, such as unemployment insurance, such as social security, such as food assistance, housing assistance. But it also grew in terms of being a spender and a, if you will, a consumer of services, so it, whether it's infrastructure, whether it is procurement policy, the public sector grew. And so the economy has become far more stable than we had once, than we had prior to the Great Depression. But it's not stable enough. We now still have ups and downs, and we still have the consequence of those downturns is still unemployment. That is the reliable outcome of recessions. That is the reliable outcome of structural shifts, factories moving abroad. That's the real reliable outcome of pandemics, crises. It's unemployment. So what we need to do is, again, think more clearly about how to stabilize the economy by addressing unemployment. And the current method is provide income support, unemployment insurance, and then throw in discretionarily some contracts in the economy. Hopefully, they will land in the right places and they'll provide the right jobs, and we know that doesn't work. So if we were to have a direct employment approach, a standby policy, safety net employment policy that will provide on-demand employment opportunities to people who need them, whatever the reason, it could be they've lost the local shop, the factory has shut down, it could be a mom is entering the labor market because the kids have gone to college. It could be whatever the reason. As if there was a framework that will provide employment on demand, then that policy will act as an automatic stabilizer because in some downturns, more people will walk in the doors and they will find decent and stable employment opportunities. And when economies recover, as we see now, people will move out. They'll find other better employment opportunities. And so the public sector will still fluctuate in this counter-cyclical way, but it will do it in a way without compromising full employment. Some people argue that a universal basic income would empower workers because it would give them the freedom to turn down bad jobs and that a job guarantee is merely a UBI with a work requirement. What's your response to that? Well, I mean, of course, it's not true. You don't empower people by giving them just income. You empower them by giving them a choice and the choice of employment. And the universal basic income will provide some kind of income support. But we know this to be true. People, even who have 
basic income or get basic income, they still want jobs. So, so long as there is a shortage of employment opportunities, no matter how much basic income people are provided, they will not be empowered to choose employment. And then there is a whole other question of does income genuinely empower? Because we do know that poverty, social exclusion, all the other socioeconomic deprivations are cannot be solved by just providing income. People need agency. They need access to various services. And employment is a really critical way in which it connects people to community and provides them the whole argument of the dignity of work, the way people connect to the employment, that they see if they are visible. Then there are many benefits. And I should also say that there are a great many people who are outside of the labor market who vitally depend on people who are in the labor market. And so income can never be a genuine alternative to employment. And so the job guarantee addresses that issue. It addresses the issue of shortage of jobs. That empowers somebody to say no to a bad job because they can have other options. Now, income might empower you if that income were enough to provide for everything else that you may need. But as I said, there are a great many dimensions to economic insecurity. It's not just income. The other thing I want to say is universal basic income is universal as it is proposed. It's not counter-cyclical stabilizer. It does not have the kind of macroeconomic functions because it is provided to all people at all times, irrespective of what happens to the economy. And then there are macroeconomic issues with that, depending on the scale and size of the universal basic income. Yes. If you are bothered about the gap between the haves and the have-nots, people lower down on the income distribution are going to spend everything they get and people higher up, well, they'll just, at the best, they'll just put it under their mattress. But there's a whole lot of options there, you know, even in low UBI to somebody who doesn't need the money to spend on necessities, you could be giving every five years, you're pretty much gifting a family a house. There's one thing that I thought have has always united the basic income and job guarantee folks, and that is a recognition that the labor market doesn't work well and that it doesn't provide the kind of economic security. So I think we all come out of an appreciation that something is broken for working families fundamentally. And where... I go is thinking about how to usher in a new form of decent and dignified employment that is secured and guaranteed. But as we have always said, this is just a piece of a broader safety net. And certainly, we don't want to be advocating for retired folks to be working. And I should mention in the United States, I talked about the decline in labor force participation rates. Well, the two groups that I increasing their participation rates are men and women 65 and over. Like That seems just fundamentally broken. We need stronger social security. We don't need folks to be coming back into the labor market looking for scarce jobs. So yes, the job guarantee will be there for the grandma that wants to be involved potentially in a community project, but that is not what we're advocating. We're talking about a good life and income support is part and parcel of that. But universal basic income, the way it often is talked about as a replacement for these interventions, as a replacement for a good job, because somehow we can't do it, or even as on the conservative right, as a replacement to the social welfare system. And so there is some danger as well there in losing public services, because presumably a generous universal basic income would substitute for that, which we know would be very pernicious. So the Biden package during the COVID pandemic included a big support package. As you said, it was just, I think it was one or two checks that were sent overall. And I think at the time that could have been thought of as a one-off basic income because it was universal as far as I understand. Did you like that policy? Did you think it was the best that could be done at the time or what alternative would you have proposed? Yes, it was a basic income policy. It was reasonably generous. It was then followed up by a child support. I've always supported universal child allowance. And I think this is critical. But what the Biden policy did is it appropriated a very large budget to beef up unemployment insurance. 
And it did some positive things because unemployment insurance in the United States does not really cover self-employed. It doesn't really cover substitute teachers, let's say. So it did expand coverage. I think it was, in a sense, a second best solution, I would say, because I much preferred the protection of employment approach. To me, again, to use an old quote by Keynes, he says it's easier to prevent the ball from rolling than to stop it when it starts rolling. So I think that in terms of full employment, protecting jobs would have been far superior. So again, paying the wage bill and the budget was large enough with money to spare. And it was significant to cover the payroll of every single worker in the economy for three months plus funding for a generous job guarantee for the unemployed. That's how much money we appropriated. But we didn't go that route. And in fact, of course, you don't have to protect all jobs. You have to only protect the ones that are endangered by the pandemic shutdowns, boomed health services. But you also can't really shut all of these down because those are essential. So if we had this vision of protecting jobs, creating a job guarantee, and mobilizing to generate, to create a public health core, I think we would have been far better positioned to respond to the health crisis, to still keep people attached to the labor market, to provide employment for people who didn't have it. And we could have potentially even used this policy to change the terms of employment. And now you could say, okay, the government is doing a public health core, $20 an hour. And there you have it, a public option that suddenly lifted the minimum wage without minimum wage legislation. So I think that the pandemic check was the easy expedient option. It was provided the support to the economy, but I would have liked to see the kind of direct investment, direct employment, the mobilization approach. In terms of critiques, Matt Brunig wrote a critique of the job guarantee back in 2018 in Jacobin. And I picked it because he plays all the hits. <laughs> and I'd like to get your response. He's still out there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 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 The mats never go away, do they? There's at least two of them. But yeah, he writes that production undertaken by a job guarantee program cannot rely upon skilled workers who can command wages higher than the minimum wage. So he's recognizing that the job guarantee wage would become the de facto minimum wage. But then to me, and I wanted to get your take on this, he makes a leap. He says, because the job guarantee workers would be minimum wage workers. He says, this means that the only production a job guarantee program could undertake is the kind of stuff that can be done exclusively with lowly skilled workers. So it is not enough for you to find a job that a low skilled worker can do. It has to be a job that is possible to do in an overall productive unit with no skilled workers in it at all. To me, I'm like, why? (laughs) But but anyway, how do you respond to that, Pavlina? Okay. There are certain kinds of jobs that require some technical expertise. But what we see in various corners of the world, developed contexts, developing contexts, we see that many different kinds of projects can be created that are socially useful, that take a range of skill. And it really depends on how the community organizes itself. It is true that this is a public option And it is by design attracts those who have the greatest difficulties in the labor market. Yeah, they may have less education and less experience because they've been shuffled around in and out of the labor market, but they are not unemployable, nor are they producing only low value work. And so this comes out of this perspective that we just need to have high value added to employment, that it's justified by some kind of level of productivity, these conventional measures. But our life is one that is supported through social services as well. And this is the aspect of our life that is underfunded. There's a great gaps in investment there. And people can fill those gaps. And we see this time and again. I mean, Ethiopia has a program of direct employment that is connected to food insecurity, and it is the most significant program, as small as it is, the most significant program that deals with floods. Okay, Mother Nature doesn't pay, right? It's not a paying customer, but this is vital for the way people live. There are other programs. The French experiment is really interesting because 
those are not lowly skilled workers. They are prime working age folks who have been out of the labor market for a long time, long term unemployed, and they have created through social enterprise various useful employment projects. So there's the gamut. You just have to see how people are doing it on the ground and how it is motivated. The examples that I gave are motivated by the recognition that no one is unemployable, that there is much social use for work that needs to be done, and that the funding is there. At least those are the three principles of the French experiment. So I find these to be, you know, abstract objections that, you know, in the practical reality, they don't really find a lot of support. Is it just me if there's an element here of prejudice against people on the minimum wage and the assumption that they can't organize themselves around useful work and that they need somebody skilled to tell them how to do things? There are actually a lot of studies and articles all the time about initiatives that communities take to make improvements at local community and that these efforts are thwarted almost always by lack of funds. So I see it as actually a way of kind of just unplugging this huge amount of talent that we just can't see due to lack of support. Absolutely. And it's also a matter of a vision of what we value and what we find to be socially useful. I mean, there is an element, it does ring of this kind of false meritocracy that they're productive, they're less productive. But we just know that at the macro level, the economy doesn't work this way to provide employment for everyone. And that there is also that paradox that not only there are folks needing work, but that there are many, just to use the low hanging fruit cliche, opportunities in the community to materially impact and improve people's lives. And those two things can be put together. And we had seen it through the New Deal projects. We had seen that with youth entitlement programs in the U.S. There are small and large programs. I think that they're just not getting enough attention and they certainly have not constituted the policy approach. The direct employment approach has been forgotten in many ways. So we better turn the corner and get to lesson three of the pandemic from your chapter, Pavlina. And lesson three is that large government spending is not the inevitable source of inflation. Tell us more about that. Well, I think economists so want this to be true because they have not seen such large scale government spending in their lifetimes. Most certainly haven't. And now, voila, we have inflation. And so in people's minds, these two things must be connected. And yet, time and again, we see that the price pressures are coming from the production side. They are coming from the disruptions, from the logistical problems. And even the Fed has been quite clear that the labor market is not the source of inflation. And yet, we are using, once again, the tool of unemployment to tame inflationary demand. So it is another similar scenario as during the 70s when we had a cost push problem. Now, I think here, maybe theoretically, we should say something about the role of government spending, where while government spending is not the cause of inflation, there is a certain sense in which government spending provides validation to those increases that it provides a purchasing power that can then, well, purchase the output that has appreciated in price. So it's not the cause, but it has allowed, if you will, these price increases to continue. And that doesn't have to be government spending. It could be just simply private credit. You know, you can have the private banking sector extend enough credit to allow the private sector to purchase the now more expensive output. So there's always going to be some sort of macroeconomic force that will validate these price increases, whether it's government spending, whether it is private finance. But this is not even part of the conversation. And certainly we should not be proposing a fiscal retrenchment to deal with price increases, just like we shouldn't be proposing increasing interest rates where it becomes prohibitively expensive to carry on any additional investment. If the source of inflation comes on the cost side and then the bottlenecks, then our focus needs to be there. And I think that is a lesson from the pandemic, which I'm not sure has been taken to heart. I think Isabella Weber's work has helped shine a spotlight on the sources of inflation. And that has been very important. <laughs> 
Speaking of sources of the price level, shall we say, what you've just said goes to your very old paper now about monopoly money. And Sam Levy, a previous guest of ours, took it up again, took up the ideas in that paper again. And I'm talking in the broad strokes here. The MMT view of the government as the source of the price level, as Warren Mosler likes to say, and you write about, Pavlina, what that says to me is the market asks for a higher price and the government's got a choice it can pay those higher prices or not pay it which means then that the economy as a whole doesn't get the money that it needs the government could say look we're not paying a penny more than we paid last year or last week then the economy as a whole doesn't get the money that it needs to pay its tax liabilities in the mmt money story and the whole system crashes and yeah okay you've brought the price level down now but governments don't really want to do that warren says i wouldn't advise this as good policy so the government has a choice when the market is demanding higher prices it can either ratify those higher prices by continuing to spend or cause the crash and it never chooses that second option and we wouldn't advise that if i'm understanding everybody correctly yes i mean there's first the very big picture macro kind of theoretical argument that if you are the exclusive issuer of a monetary instrument and that you have the choice of setting the price you can set the conversion rate between the currency and what it exchanges for we have done this in the past by setting it against gold But what we are proposing is that it be set against some kind of basic unit of labor, wage, maybe via a kind of a job guarantee. So there is an anchoring macro story here that the public sector spends currency into existence. And what is it worth? Well, it's worth whatever it exchanges for. And we think that labor is worth more of a price support than corn or gold. So we can set the price of some essential commodities and that prices then become a function of that price paid by government. So that's a very kind of this simple stylized version of the monopoly price setting powers. Then the complication happens in the real world because the government absolutely has price setting powers, even if at the macro level, it doesn't provide the currency, if you will, in enough to choke off the demand for it, right? Even if we still have quasi-austerity, you still can set prices of certain sectors through procurement, for example. So we've got these kind of distortions. We understand that the deficit is part of the macro markup, but we have these distortions that occur where the public sector has abdicated this pricing power to private contractors. So there was a great report just last week on what the military charges the government for valves. You can get that valve on Amazon for like $200. The government pays $10,000 for some valve, right? And it's these sorts of things are just, I think there's a good research paper for a young aspiring PhD on how government procurement has evolved over the years and how that has actually surrendered the pricing powers to the private contractors. So that's one thing. On the other hand, and certainly you can look at the subsidies that we provide to certain industries, but then we don't allocate enough resources in other areas. So there are these various kinds of distortions that happen at the micro level. And at the macro level, the overall government contribution to the economy is going to either validate prices or not. And that will be true for spending by the private economy as well, right? Like prices will be validated on the basis of the overall spending power that comes from different sources of demand. I was wondering about that because Sam Levy, he was here talking about his own research on the price level setting. And he mentioned that whilst the government has the power to set prices, often that comes at a cost. So I think he mentioned that in the context of, say, reducing wages or forcing its own prices on the private sector, that eventually the private sector will have no choice but to follow the government, but that there may be a period where you may have the government not being able to, as you say, supply its own services and things like that. So that sort of cast doubt in my head about 
who's got the power here and what's that relationship? And is the government really in a position to choose the price level if the cost is so great politically? Yeah, no, I think that's right. And it goes back to the earlier comment that money is at bottom a political project and how budgetary policy is shaped and formed and who gets to bid, who gets to be have the exclusive relationship with the government and be an exclusive supplier matters very much in the kind of distributed outcomes that we get. I think that's probably true. I mean, as we like to say, the paradox of the MMT project is that while we want to illustrate that money is no object and is not scarce, it certainly demonstrates that money can't solve all our problems. Or the idea is we're trying to make money the least important thing in policy discussions of finding the money. Exactly. Okay, so uh, see what you think, Pavlina. Well, I thought an interesting way to bring the job guarantee alive in people's imaginations might be to walk through an alternate timeline of what would have happened in a country like the UK or the US that had implemented a job guarantee as a permanent program decades ago and kept it. So stagflation in the 70s, various bubbles that come after that, the dot-com bubble, the great financial crisis, the pandemic. How might these things have played out in a country with a job guarantee? I know that's a big question and time is limited, so maybe you prefer to take the more recent shocks, but you can talk about all of them if you want, whatever you prefer. One thing we can say is that financial crisis and pandemics of wars would certainly have happened. Again, the job guarantee is not the solution to that. What we probably would have avoided is these jobless recoveries, which have really eroded the social fabric and created what I think have contributed to this enormous polarization. But what I think we would have had, even if we had reauthorized the New Deal programs, I think we would have had a more robust, if you will, conservation movement. I mean, it was resuscitated with the CCC back during the New Deal, reforestation, national parks, we would have had a more concerted effort to continue and support these ongoing public service projects that address broader social environmental concerns. Young people would have had kind of a stepping stone. We've seen that youth around the world have had the highest levels of unemployment and for some depression levels of unemployment. This whole conversation about need the not in education, employment, or training. I think that is a conversation maybe we wouldn't have had. Maybe we would have talked about the four-day working week or six-hour working day much sooner than now. Maybe that would have been a conversation back in the 60s and 70s. I mean, in the United States, the 30-hour working week, as I write in my book, was narrowly defeated in the 30s. So even back then, there was overwhelming support for that. And maybe we wouldn't be as overworked. Who knows? This is the possibilities of our grandchildren paradox for Keynes, that we're wealthier and yet we're overworked and somehow still have essential needs not supported. But I think that just providing employment support on an ongoing basis, long-run employment, would have made conversations of trade a lot easier. The anxieties around job loss, certainly AI. So yeah, in my ideal world, I imagine that we would have had some kind of employment support to these bigger conversations. Of course, it could turn another way. Job guarantees are guarantees only because they're implemented on democratic terms and on participatory terms. And that's what we're talking about, not about Orban-style forced employment. And before we wrap up, Pavlina, we should just plug this year's keynote address at the Economic Democracy Initiative Summer Workshop. It's James Galbraith, as I believe, and it's open to the public. Yes, Jamie Galbraith will be talking about the economics and politics of inflation fighting around the world. We have a big workshop attended by 50, 60 students from around the world with a lot of faculty. And we're just very, very excited for the second year. There are no more places for students there, but the keynote address is open to the public. Correct. The keynote address is open to the public. It's being held at the Franklin Delano Roosevelt Library in Hyde Park in New York, very close to Bard College. And while there are no spots for the summer school, we do have lots of availability for the open keynote. It's on Thursday, June the 15th.
Great stuff. That's a great place to leave it. We've been talking to Professor Pavlina Chernova, economist and author of The Case for a Job Guarantee, which is an essential read, as is her chapter in the equally essential MMT Key Insights Leading Thinkers. I'll link to where you can get hold of both of those in the show notes for this episode. And for our Patreon subscribers, there's a link to where you can listen to the edited audio highlights of the book launch of MMT Key Insights Leading Thinkers. And finally, we can now announce that applications are open for the Edward Lipinski Foundation's MMT Summer School in Poznan, Poland. That takes place from the 5th to the 7th of September 2023. Confirmed speakers so far include Stephen Hale, L. Randall Ray, Nathan Tankus, and Yan Lang. So that's going to be fantastic. Check out the show notes for details. But for now, thanks so much for joining us today on the MMT podcast, Professor Pavlina Chernova. Thank you so much for having me. That was the MMT Podcast with Patricia Pino and Christian Riley. Don't forget, you can support the show through Patreon, starting at a dollar a month, and get access to patron-only episodes. You can do that by going to patreon.com slash MMT Podcast. You can also find me on Twitter at MMT Podcast, and you can find Patricia on Twitter at Patricia N. Pino. And you can email us at mmtpodcast at outlook.com. Thanks for listening, and we hope to hear from you.